me hit record. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Now that we're in our third and final section of this seminar on security, where we try and synthesize um, the first section on the internal world and sort of coming from object relations and a lot of critique of the kind of normative theories of development of, around security and our second session, uh, which focused on three different readings of the social world. So here we are in the psychosocial uh, final third, starting with Prawana Nazif, who is joining us today. Um, Prawana is a PhD candidate at USC, and her research involves histories of radical psychiatry um, with a focus on Fernand Delaney's collective uh, and also Tuskeus, who we're going to hear about today, and Fanon. Um, so uh, Prawana is doing all kinds of work. I'll put some links in the chat, uh, but including for the security issue of Parapraxis, putting together a large uh, Tuskeus portfolio, including some previously... Uh, never uh, translated text from the French and also a lot of images uh, that will be super beautiful. And so we have that to look forward to this summer. Um, so I'll let Prawana take it away and I'll start putting some links to her work in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you to Parapraxis and the Psychosocial Foundation for the extremely generous invitation to contribute um, to such a robust rigorous and uh, moving seminar series. Um, it's really an honor to be in the company of such brilliance. Um, and I also want to extend my gratitude to all those attending. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we can continue this conversation um, outside of the seminar space today too. And that um, at the very least, we can sort of start the beginning of an unspooling thread that may or may not continue on this path um, of radical psychiatry or uh, diverge. Um, so I'm actually going to start with a very short film clip, um, just because I think it gives like a very great uh, introduction to Tosquea's. Um, it's silent, um, and I will do that right now. This. Okay. So that was a film clip from Medea Salades and Joanna Masso's film, The Potential History of Francesca Tosquez, um, which will be screening in New York uh, soon. So I can send over more information about that. But um, I wanted to both begin with this and also some Tosquez quotes uh, from several interviews that I think do well to introduce both the figure and the mythology of Francesca Tosquez and his work. Um, and also show why undertaking a historical narrative of his legacy and practice, um, which I will attempt to today, is both difficult and necessary. Um, so if you allow me, I'll just say a couple of Tosquea's quotes, um, because I know that we didn't get to read any uh, 
texts by him specifically for uh, the seminar. So the first quote is, a narrow path often opens between two margins in social praxis of psychiatry or even politics. This is perhaps what you call my ambiguities. It is not a question of ambivalent hesitations, but of taking into consideration and establishing the balance between two powers. And then in the same interview, he states, I am a little suspicious of all theories, mine first of all. I am wary of our inclinations towards abstractions. Um, and sort of on the subject of translations and foreignness, which we'll go into a bit more later today, um, both of which are important facets uh, to his clinical practice and thought, uh, he states, to be a good psychiatrist, one must be a foreigner or pretend to be one. One must make real effort to understand one, translate and take active stances towards me, uh, talking about himself. Uh, and in another interview, he states, all I have left is my accent to make me incomprehensible. It's very important to be incomprehensible. So with all of Tosquez's abstractions, ambiguities, contradictions, and incomprehensibilities, um, I find it necessary to focus on the biographical and historical narratives today to clarify the contexts and milieus in which he was involved in, um, and that also actively shaped the process of radical psychiatry and its subsequent iterations. Um, so I'll just dive into uh, this biographical historical context. Uh, so Francesc Tosquez, also known as Francois Tosquez, and this ambiguity around what to call him or how to say his name is already quite indicative of his practice and thought. Um, so Tosquez is known as one of the major, if not most important founders of institutional psychotherapy, originating in the experimental institution Saint Alban in France in the late 20th century. The namings for institutional psychotherapy vary. Uh, Fanon often called it social therapy, other times it was called sector psychiatry um, or psychotherapy. Um, and other times it was also called psychoanalytic psychiatry. Uh, Jean Uri of Laborde has argued that institutional psychotherapy, the name is insufficient as a naming, as it does not exist given that the practice is a process always in the making and therefore it never actually arrives or is necessarily accomplished. So the histories of radical psychiatry as well as Tosquez's major role in radical psychiatry including its vast contributions and multidisciplinary approaches to philosophy, film and art, radical Marxist politics, disability and mad studies, and psychoanalytic and psychiatric practice is still largely obscured, obscured today. Um, so today's seminar, as I said, will be largely historical and will detail the histories that the readings go over. Um, we're at a moment where there are a lot of upcoming or current exhibitions, um, especially in Europe, uh, new scholarship and books in translation and archives being established on radical psychiatry um, and Tosquez's legacy and work, some of which is also uh, very problematically depoliticized. Uh, so clarifying some of these historical narratives on Tosquez's experiences and the experimental institution he was involved in, uh, Saint Alban, is quite important to radical psychiatry's legacy as a militant political and psychiatric practice, um, especially in this moment of renewed interest. Um, so on this note, I also want to say that a large part of this lecture is drawn from and informed by Joanna Moss's work on Tosquias, uh, some of which he read for the seminar. Um, and a lot of it will be translated into English in the next year or so. Um, and again, I can also send over links for that too. So Tosquias, a Catalan psychiatrist and refugee from the Spanish Civil War, ran Saint Alban in France between the early 1940s and 1962. The institution was radical in every sense, dimension, and direction of the term, occupying a very destabilized, vertiginous grounding, as in a thinking and practice that testifies to both the horizontal and very precarious framework. Saint Alban's institutional psychotherapy practice of radically transforming the institution as a permanent revolution, as in as always in revolution, uh, was quite distinct from the anti-psychiatry movement's aim for total deinstitutionalization which was um, heightened in the 60s and 70s, particularly in Italy and the United Kingdom. So institutional psychotherapy through Tosquez's interventions claimed the institution as a refuge and as a site for possible transformations. The practice sought to rethink the hospital in a concretely dynamic framework and to recognize rather than pathologize madness as another form of life 
Institutional psychotherapy emerged within the context of World War II and the Nazi and Vichy regimes' genocidal practices against the cognitively differently abled, as well as the Spanish Civil War and Tosquillas' exile from Franco's Spain, along with his involvement in organized working class movements against fascism. Saint-Alban also served as a major influence for French critical thought, and its staff included, as I noted earlier, Franz Fanon and Jean Uri. The institution also hosted psychiatrists like Félix Flattery, Philippe Pommel, and also indirectly Michel Foucault, um, as Tosquet supervised his training in psychotherapy with Henry A. So the institution also housed Jewish refugees, resistance fighters, and other political dissidents. Nuns and sex workers were significant members of the caregivers and collective, and the, wall, the walls were quite literally torn down. So if there was a pathology at Saint Alban, it was attributed to the institution itself. I mean, this doesn't necessarily exclude the worlds outside of it. The question then was one of an ongoing cure for the institution itself. So noting these intimate entanglements of the psychic and political and the importance of so-called madness, exile, political psychic praxis, it's quite necessary to bring up the Zionist war machine's carnage um, in their production of ongoing catastrophe of settler colonial violence, herbicide, epistemicide, and genocide upon Palestinians, and the total decimation of Gaza, as I speak. Uh, noting that also language remains insufficient to address these violences. So the heavy historical echoes of war, fascism, and genocide reverberate in shrilling, but also distinct and singular tones. Of particular importance, then, is Tosquez's radical provocations on war, and war's significant relationship to institutional psychotherapy, which we will go into later um, along with Fanon's distinct articulations. So in this sense, um, I also want us to think critically on certain operative uses of madness, um, on hysteric disorientations of symbolic and spatial orders and logics of daily life, of war, of humanity, collectivity, and permanent ongoing revolutions in terms of engagement and discourse um, of self-critical and critical spaces, on links with the border and foreignness, on enunciations and imaginaries and so forth. Um, all this to say that hopefully this can be a space to see if institutional psychotherapy or to work through, I mean, um, <clears throat> institutional psychotherapy and Fanon's translation of the practice can be an appropriate framework to think through not only security, but liberation and resistance uh, particularly in stressing the tensions and the indirect and direct encounters between Fanon and Tosquez's clinical practices. Relatedly, we can see how political psychic practice is weaponized on a state level, from diagnoses and pathologizing of, and the pathologizing of so-called madness to very materialized debilitation. Such weaponization seeks to not only name reality, legitimize knowledge and truth, but to reproduce these realities. And we see this very clearly in Fanon's work and analyses. Included in this then is the intentional physical and psychological violence inflicted by the Zionist settler state of Israel on Palestinians. This infliction, one of whiteness's militarized psychopathology leads into global Western orders precisely by design, such as the media's discursive obliteration and demonization of Palestinians, as Samira Esmer has remarked. Zionist war machine therefore engages in reality bending, including obliterations of histories, precisely as a fundamental aspect of Zionism, as a nationalist ideology, as Laura and Stephen Sheehy have noted. Symbolic violences have real, intended, and directed material effects, as in the effect of such psychic violences, along with its obscurity and epistemological legacies, is genocidal. Thus, in face of violence and psychopathies of silence, how can we practice liberation psychically, psychologically too? In face of these symbolic and material violences, how do we refute narratives that depend on Palestinians as submissive victims, as maimed victims? Institutional psychotherapy is but one iteration of political psychic praxis as a liberatory practice where psychological liberation and psychic psychoanalysis are precisely politically engaged practices. It speaks to the personal, the social collective and poetic as an imagination. So taking this into account, and as a seminar is on the subject of security, um, I find it necessary that we begin with the understanding that hospitals, asylums, and of course prisons are devices that spatially organize and emerge a population, 
as an object of knowledge and also is heavily involved in conceptions and designations of normality, illness, and so forth, as scholars like Foucault write of. In Fanon's call for day hospitalization, which you all read on, he asserts that the psychiatrist is the auxiliary of the police. There is, however, as Susan Callow's work notes, a role that space and architecture plays in the therapeutic process beyond enclosure and management of visibility. I'm specifically referring to Tuskeyes um, in Saint Alban as a site of resistance and militancy in both political and medical terms. But just as Tuskeyes saw anti-psychiatry as pure utopia thinking, he was not romanticizing institutions, uh, and nor madness for that matter. He was insistent that hospitals were always potentially carceral, closed, and totalitarian, just like other forms of organization that do not escape the carceral horizon. As he wrote, a good citizen is incapable of practicing psychiatry. He preferred the refuge associated with the term asylum and the more explicit precarity associated with the term establishment, for him at least, uh, to institution. No space for Tosquez was not institutionalized. And so for institutional psychotherapy, the institution itself needed to be cured. It needed to be constantly transforming or mutating, and most importantly, a place where exchange was possible. Places, as in, in the plural, to say, or rather, to listen. Freedom, in opposition to both Fanon's spatialization of the hospital and anti-psychiatry, would not be found outside of psychiatric hospitals for Tuskeyes, which is quite a provocative statement. The question of and commitment to abolition and liberation becomes interesting here, especially as institutional psychotherapy for Tosquez involved concrete forms, possibilities, and institutional work, which for him is always necessary and always political. His criticism of anti-psychiatry is not opposed to major concerns of disability abolitionism today. Liet Ben Mosh argues for conceptualizing deinstitutionalization as a logic, as a mindset, and a movement and not exclusively as a social and historical process. Ben Mosh argues against advocacy of reinstitutionalization from the faulty prison, prisons as the new asylum thesis. Um, this thesis blames deinstitutionalization so as to shift away from neoliberal policies that led simultaneously to both the growth of the prison system and also to the lack of accessible and affordable housing. So Ben Mosh argues that the thesis also disregards the disabling mechanisms of these policies and the structural violences. In arguing against this thesis, Ben Mosh acknowledges uh, the reality of having numbers of people with disabilities, psychiatric, cognitive, learning disabilities in particular, in jails and prisons, um, and simultaneously maintains and asserts that carcerality, state violence, and police power are disability and mad is issues. Given these concerns, to place Tuskegee's institutional psychotherapy neatly into institutionalization or deinstitutionalization, and I would also argue as anti-abolitionist, would be to grossly mischaracterize and misunderstand the practice. As it was perpetually transforming then, Saint Alban was not meant to be a formulaic model. It was open, in movement and in process. And we can see this in the later iterations or translations of institutional psychotherapy, such as Fanon's work in North Africa, and Jean Uri and Felix Quattri's extension at Le Bot. Historically, in the 19th century, there was a shift towards medical power in France. And as Foucault notes, this is when scientific psychiatry is possible through the transfer of powers to psychiatric hospitals from the courts. Each French department was designated its own public hospital with a psychiatrist officially communicating with political and administrative structures of the region. Madness, therefore, was less associated with prison and criminalization with the law of 1838 and became, as Joanna Masso notes, mental illness, dependent on this medical power and new structures of seclusion. Although, of course, by no means were these necessarily exclusive from the carceral, and undoubtedly there is continuity between all these forms of social control, um, as historically noted by various disability abolitionists. Um, it did, however, institute a new form of power that legally distinguished it from crime. So as Foucault points to in his gene genealogical study of madness and in institutions, psychiatric disabilities and differences are not just medical conditions, but historical formations that can justify maltreatment and disenfranchisement through, as we see with mad studies, 
socially and con culturally contingent designations of normal, able, average, and sane. Uh, even as these form, e even as this forms the basis uh, for social movements, cultural practices, and political identities. The law of 1838 then marked the uh, beginning of the independence of psychiatric power in the 19th century uh, for Foucault, along with its new forms of government. Uh, psychiatric power is also historically a technology of racial surveillance, security, and control. And as Fanon's statement indicates earlier, the politics of disability is bound to police power and racialized surveillance and control. As Mar Mar Maso remarks, however, Tosquet saw potential in the protection of the law afforded through the psychiatrist as medical authority, uh, a public official and administrator, um, as protecting from the abuses of the administration and the family institution, while allowing for organizations of a local economy and new forms of contingent freedom. We can see today how state recognition and protection of disabled subjects often leads to grounds for surveillance and securitization and how Tosquez's perceived potential in the 1838 law anticipates this risk and also affords a certain precarious or perhaps idealist protection against it. In Catalonia in the early 20th century, there was a decentralization movement of psychiatric care away from major cities. This territorial reorganization was due in large part to allow patients, um, mostly living away from major cities, to be both closer to families and their environments. Space then, as Susan Kahlo notes, becomes an object and means of the therapeutic process uh, and not just simply a site. Tosquez was born in the midst of this reorganization in 1912 in Reus. He was already beginning to work at the Radical Paramata Institute in Reus at the age of 15, although some accounts claim even as early as at the age of 10. Uh, alongside his studies in German, Tosquez studied medicine, uh, specializing in psychiatry, and finishes at the young age of 22 in 1934, although he does need to uh, res uh, restart his medical studies in France as they don't accept his um, Spanish degree. Years prior to receiving his medical degree, he attends his mentor, Dr. Mira's seminars on Freud and Marx which as both Pierre de Leon and Camille Ropsis have put, will be the foundational two legs of institutional psychotherapy, um, where he reads Lacan's thesis, which he will later use to train doctors and nurses at the Paramount Institute, as well as at Saint Alban. And here we start to see uh, sort of interesting border crossings and returns and returns through the informal printing uh, and collective translations here at Lacan. So Barcelona during this period was called Little Vienna because it had welcomed a number of Jewish psychoanalyst exiles from Eastern Europe. From 1933 to 1937, Tosquez formally works at the Paramount Institute, as well as in uh, a child psychiatry clinic and child care center, um, which are impressionable experiences given the weight Tosquez later gives to childhood and clinical pro practice. His written work constantly refers to this importance, writing that we need to get involved in child psychiatry in order to be able to do psychiatry for adults and the elderly. Um, and also writing uh, sort of repeatedly that a true revolution consists in resuming one's childhood. Uh, and one can uh, see quite clearly how Tosquez was invested in Melanie Klein's work here, um, as well as Lacan's. So during his studies, Tosquez is also heavily involved with political groups in the interwar period, and psychiatric reform uh, is a major part of the Catalanist political project. He joins Bloc, the worker and peasant Bloc, and later joins PUM, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, which calls for decentralization, self-management, and worker solidarity in opposition to Stalinism, and PUM was highly critical of the Spanish Communist Party. As Camille Robsis notes, Tosquez is repeated throughout his life um, that Pum and this experience with radical democratic politics taught him to be extremely wary of what he called the all power, the potential of all institutions, all politics, and all so social formations to become rigid, oppressive, and despotic. These political experiences fundamentally shaped Tosquez's psychiatric practice. Um, and this potential we will later see is approached and challenged through different means by Fanon and Tosquez. Um, so now I want to shift over to another film clip um, of a letter that Tosquez supposedly sent to Stalin in 1927, but it was never found. Um, and in Medea Solares' and Joanna Maso's film, they have uh, people today 
uh, reading this letter um, at cafes and bars uh, in Catalan, Catalonia. So let me pull that up. Un secretari d'un seminari sobre Marx i Freud que reuneix 150 treballadors a l'Ateneu Enciclopèdic Popular de Barcelona, que és la seu dels anarquistes de la ciutat. Va ser una iniciativa del professor Emile Mira i López convençut que és a través d'aquests dos autors que entendrem el funcionament de l'alineació humana, que per entendre a fons la bogeria cal treballar amb l'home normal. Que la psiquiatria teòrica allunyada de la pràctica és perillosa perquè la falta de pragmatisme ens porta al feixisme. I és que abans de la Primera Guerra Mundial es creia en l'efecte saludable que podia tenir la presa de consciència. Pensàvem que calia que el subjecte pogués esdevenir conscient dels seus problemes inconscients, desconeguts per si mateix. I que quan aquesta veritat acabada de conèixer fos formulada, el patiment de la persona desapareixeria. Però Freud ens va desfer aquesta il·lusió. I jo mateix, si tingués alguna cosa a profetitzar, imaginaria que el proletariat pogués quedar connectat amb l'inconscient i no tant amb la presa de consciència. I com que l'inconscient, més que existir, el que fa és insistir, crec que la lluita obrera haurà d'insistir. Caldrà dir, treballadors del món, insistiu. L'inconscient va aparèixer a Barcelona quan amb la República la ciutat es va convertir en una petita Viena on van arribar tots aquells psiquiatres jueus que fugint de l'antisemitisme que creixia a centre Europa i parlant només alemany, txec o hongarès es van refugiar a Catalunya. És aleshores que va començar a haver-hi anàlisi concreta amb experiència viscuda perquè eren estrangers, perquè estem plens i impregnats de l'estranger que portem dins. I és gràcies a això que el procés analític va molt millor. Perquè un psiquiatre, per ser bon psiquiatre, ha de ser estranger o fer-ho veure. En teràpia cal fer un esforç per entendre el que l'altre viu. Estem obligats a traduir. Jo mateix vaig fer la meva teràpia en català, amb Sandor Eiminder, que només parlava hongarès. I vaig passar gairebé un any de la meva psicoanàlisi sense pagar gràcies a l'Ateneu Barcelonès, perquè el bar, on jo menjava de tant en tant, el duia un paio que es deia Francisco, que em feia crèdit a mi i al meu psicoanalista. A l'Ateneu t'hi podies trobar amb tothom. La biblioteca estava oberta tota la nit. Era un lloc collonut per treballar. Allí vam trobar-hi en Dalí i els surrealistes que van convertir la bogeria en un moviment experimental produït per la societat, portant el freudisme a les portes de la ciutat abans que es convertís en una sèrie de trucs per vendre mercaderies. Aquest vincle revolucionari amb l'inconscient continuà a l'Institut Pere Mata de Reus quan el 1932 vam treballar la tesi doctoral de Jacques Lacan sobre la paranoia com a base de la personalitat de tots nosaltres. I és que tenim clar que el malestar social no es pot separar del malestar de l'ànima i que no hi ha malalts mentals sense societats malaltes. Hem de curar les institucions i protegir-les de l'Estat, perquè la funció de l'Estat és impedir les institucions. Per això nosaltres som més de nació permanent que d'Estat o de mare pàtria, tot i que sabem la importància de la bona llet de les mares. A Reus, per exemple, hi havia un metge pediatre, el doctor Frias, que ensenyava a lletar a les mares i deia «Si un té bona llet, ja es va bé». Em va demanar que m'encarregués de l'atenció al lactant i la mare, i també de nens més grandets que tenien problemes a l'escola. Jo rebia les mares en grup. Els deia que volia fer un treball sobre les dificultats que tenen les mares per cuidar les criatures que acaben de tenir i que, com jo era jove i d'allò no en sabia res, em fessin el favor de parlar-me'n. Capgirava l'atenció. Elles sabien i jo no. Aquesta psicoteràpia infantil va continuar perquè el moment polític ho va permetre, amb les expropiacions que van venir després. Durant els primers mesos de la guerra, 
amb l'Hortonada, un company ja del PUM, que en el mateix comitè de Reus s'ocupava de sanitat, vam poder requisar dos masos de les colònies de la carretera de Salou. Ara encabitza l'urbanització del barri Fortuny. I és allí on amb el mestre Ganiguer i l'atleta Jesús Montaner vam poder aposentar les bases, sempre precàries, de la psicoteràpia infantil i juvenil. Encara em sorprèn com la majoria d'homes, sobretot psiquiatres, manifesten una veritable fòbia per la infància. Em pregunto si el que separa els psiquiatres de la psicoanàlisi no és menys l'inconscient que la negació de la seva infància i d'aquí ve la seva ceguesa. L'oliva més aviat em prenia el pèl, dient-me que dels pixerris i dels cagons no se'n podia fer gaire cosa revolucionària. Aquests projectes només eren, per a l'oliva, un joc d'intel·lectual. Però jo li explicava que dels pixums i del cagar, en definitiva, de la merda, la psicoteràpia i els catalans sempre n'han fet grans coses. Ja que si no treballem amb la merda, estic convençut, camarada, que arribarà un dia que la merda ens governarà. Perquè per guanyar la guerra al front cal una rereguarda ben organitzada. Sí, efectivament. Efectivament. Vinga, i en totes les revolucions... Sóc català. I en totes les revolucions... I en totes les revolucions sempre s'ha de recuperar la pròpia infància. Ok. I don't believe that was actually the film clip I saved for the letter to Stalin, but it's also a great clip, so we'll just keep moving forward. Um, I have a lot of film clips to show, so um, apologies for that. Um, so Tosquez joins the resistance through Pum in 1936 in the civil war in Spain against Franco. It is here at the Aragon front that Tosquez argues that he treated more doctors than soldiers at the front, uh, arguing that their bourgeois mentality of individualism and maintenance of a certain type of stability was in fact in opposition to the practice of psychiatry, as was their phobic positions regarding madness or psychosis, uh, as well as we just saw childhood. When he became medical chief of psychiatric services of the Republican army and was relocated to the Southern Front, Tuskegee began to organize a series of collective experiments against common conceptions of psychiatry. Uh, and beyond the walls of the hospital into new eras, what his mentor Mira called extensive psychiatry. Tuskegee insisted on treating war victims where they were, as in not wanting to disassociate the ills of war from war itself. To distant the patient from the front would mean chronic illness or extensive illness. There is then a dispersion of psychiatry in extension psychiatry or extensive psychiatry, excuse me. Uh, and simultaneously a sort of fixed proximity. The borders of the walls of the hospital then both retract and expand in terms of an illness with an identifiable cause or agent that can be delimited uh, in this sort of formulation. We will see this dissemination of extensive psychiatry in Saint Alban originating with uh, the director Agnes Masson, where by way of this extension, there is a continuum established between the so-called normal, the so-called mad, via a particular blurring of boundaries. So already Tosquez is curing the institution in these early experiments and radically critiquing it, not by way of abolishing madness nor abolishing the hospitals, uh, which would immediately integrate, or as Fanon would maybe say, assimilate patients into so-called normality in the daily fabric of social life. Abolishing psychiatric hospitals for Tosquez does not reduce madness to nothing and moving it to the place of the usual civilian community contributes to its ignorance. There is a blurring then, but with Tosquez's investment in the establishment, uh, and I'll interchangeably use institution throughout uh, the seminar. Um, so his investment in the establishment as a place of refuge, there is still a marked boundary or a conception of a more porous, troubled, and perhaps ultimately unknowable outside to the hospital. Um, I sort of leave this open. Uh, is it the marked limits of a so-called madness or difference, an outside to madness, an end to madness or illness? Um, I'll leave that open for us to maybe uh, explore later on. In an interview in the 80s, Tuskegee's remarks that in Saint Alban, they would have groups where patients were taught how to not hallucinate or act crazy in public. As in, as Tuskegee states, 
His psychopedagogy was to teach the patients how to conceal madness from people who do not understand it. The notion of the public here includes the family uh, and this threat of incarceration, whereas patients were free to hallucinate all they wanted in the hospital, uh, a freedom to let be or to be. So there's a similar contraction and expansion uh, as with the early extensive psychiatry here, uh, and perhaps more starkly bordered here with the conception of uh, a refuge. So as Joanna Masso argues, with Tosquez's practice of extensive psychiatry early on, psychiatry thus became, becomes related to social work and political engagement through being put into practice within the political context of the war. At a worker control meeting, Tosquez asks if Paramount Institute is a militant organization, a social assistance organization, or industry in the hands of worker control. He then asserts that there must be a joint action with the aim of a new organization explicitly tying these all together. Given his proclivities towards tying together, knots abound in Tosquez's practice. At the front, Tosquez's remarks that he treated more doctors and patients was in line with his mentor Mira's advice to him that to take care of the so-called insane, he had to first know normal men. Tosquez's provocative statement that war is a kind of paradise for us, us meaning psychiatrists, is due not only to the possibility of practicing collective work in proximity to war's violence and agony, but as Tuskegee states, with war comes resistance. The lived experience of war, as Maso notes, was for Tuskegee's the encounter between the experience of catastrophe and that of madness, between end of the world anxiety of so-called normal people and the psychological suffering of the excluded. He associates war and the feeling of a disappearance of the world with political experience, where with an absence of a future specific to war, there is a desire to remake the world. Fanon's resignation at Blida characterized a resistance to psychiatry and the joining of the FLN as perhaps the most concretized expression of institutional psychotherapy. This can also still be seen as a practice of Tuskegee's statement of the resistance that comes along with war, but taken further and transformed. Uh, which also affirms the fluid practice of institutional psychotherapy. Fanon's resignation letter at Blida upon joining the FLN marks differently the obfuscated and permeable boundaries of Tosquez's spatialization of radical psychiatry, where Fanon's letter is a refusal to treat towards assimilation and normalization of colonialism and within a system of colonial ethno-psychiatry. In Fanon's subsequent writings on day hospitalization, he critiques the distinction made between the outside or social milieu and public and the world created or the neo-society within the institution as a form of internment, no matter how radical its practices are. The neo-society for Fanon delimits social therapy and its effectivity at disalienating. For him, the consummate social therapeutic milieu is that of concrete society itself. For Tosquez, the wall protected the sick from the abuses of society while Fanon insists post Blida that such internment is conceived of as protection for society and the asylum is conceived of as protection of the mad person against themselves. Internment marks the hospital as closed in on itself, fixedly, neo-society included. Thus, Fanon proposes a psychiatric hospital that is annexed to a general hospital so that the psychiatrist is not alienated and has access to the material infrastructure of a general hospital. We can also hear echoes of an insistence against a romanticization of madness here, perhaps surfacing Fanon's nuanced criticisms of negritude and against the European surrealist inclination to fetishize madness. The proposal of day hospitalization for Fanon guarantees total freedom to the patient. patient. While both Tosquez and Fanon emphasize the importance of the milieu and socialization, Fanon was far more radical and critical in his break from the institution so as for the patient to be engaged with society, with family, and the professional milieu. So this leads us to consider Tuskegee's provocative statements with war as potentially figured more as an event, perhaps, or an event closed in on itself, uh, especially within his treatment of the sick at the front and proximate to the uh, cause of their illness. So I'm wondering how we can think of this provocative statement along with resistance uh, as we witness Israel's ongoing and heightened production of the catastrophic, of the end of the world, history and desire in Gaza. Can Fanon's prioritizing of the concrete along with the imaginary and symbolic 
along with Tosquez's insistence on resistance, provide a useful framework or analytic here. In addition to extensive psychiatry, Tosquez was practicing informal modes in his psychiatric work at the front, where he questioned the traditional definition of not only the profession itself and professionalization, but also the the assumed defining feature of the profession of psychiatrists and nurses, uh, that defining characteristic of doctors, uh, as we've sort of repeatedly shown, uh, is um, as the doctor as afraid of madness. He thus had an active role in recruiting non-professional or non-specialist medical teams. He selected those unfamiliar, at least professionally, with mental illness, such as local painters, priests, lawyers, farmers, sex workers. As Maso puts it, he created a landscape of life in time of war where psychiatric hospitals seemed to belong more to civilian populations than to military order. There is a particular localization here in the sense of the community Tuskez was establishing and an openness where he was soliciting from the exterior of the hospital or institution in order to transform the interior. Thus, again, both destabilizing and still sort of maintaining the ghost of a marked boundary of interiority and exteriority. It's not so much that there was an ultimate indistinguishability or substitutability between the interior and exterior, but dynamic exchange and an irresolvable oscillation between a spatial and perhaps temporal passage through the marked and changing limits of the outside, dynamic and ultimately unknowable. The brothels closed during the war became an external department. Uh, again, the boundaries shift that are still present of exteriority and interiority here. Um, they became an external department to the hospital where the brothels stopped hosting sexual relations between soldiers and sex workers. The sex workers or sexual assistants, as to say is called them, were still working as they were instructed to write reports on the sexuality of the soldiers. Both parties then, as Maso astutely observes, had a different relationship to sex and sexuality as they changed jobs without changing locations. So again, geography and proximity become an important element to Tosquez's collective clinical practice. An echo of treating the patient at the site of the ills of war, where relations are dynamically transformed and where the subject of sex is approached through different relations within the same site. There is a sort of differently repeated exterior outside here that is also irreducible to an immediate exteriority or physical outside of. After the front, Tosquez goes into exile and sets up a barrack for psychiatric care at the Set Fond refugee camp in France. Importantly, this is also located at the border of the camp where one can also escape. Tosquez remarks that the psychiatric service was just one of the transit points. I think that this process of psychiatry um, towards escaping, uh, we could sort of hazard as Tosquez's abolitionist practice. Um, and that arguably Saint Alban's praxis is a continuation of Tosquez's psychiatric barrack qua vehicle of escape in the refugee camp. If anything, this barrack was his ideal, uh, and he explicitly stated so. He said he practiced the best psychiatry he's ever practiced at the refugee camp. Conditions were extremely dire here, and Tosquez was only here for around three months and left after the director, Paul Bolve, uh, of Saint Alban invited him over to Saint Alban. The legend goes that Tosquez couldn't find Saint Alban in the Lozere region on the map and went ahead, preferring to journey in the manner of not knowing where he's going um, nor how to get there. Uh, very Tosquez. Um, he arrives at Saint Alban in 1940 as an assistant nurse. Um, as I said, they, uh, they wouldn't accept his Spanish degree, so he had to start his medical studies over again in France. Um, and his first voluntary activities included working with autistic children off the hospital grounds in a colony that was also in very poor condition. Um, apparently, Tosquez asked to work here when Balve noted that he was ashamed of this area, um, as the children were isolated, literally in dirt, uh, and very malnourished. He also asked to spend time with the villagers in Lozere and sort of the surrounding, uh, surrounding fields upon his arrival. Um, in an interview, Tosquez remarks that his uncle, um, who, is, uh, who was a doctor and worked at Paramata Institute uh, and was known for his role in the advent of psychoanalysis in Reus, uh, decided to become a village doctor away from the city um, and saw that as the best way to do psychiatric work. And Tosquez represents this as an ideal paradigm for himself. 
So given the importance of the milieu and the relationships with the peasants and villagers of Lozère, I want to watch a clip from filmmaker Mario Raspoli's film um, of the villagers in Lozère in collaboration with Tosquea's. So you see, I believe it's just the back of Tosquea's head speaking in this uh, shorter film clip. Mm. Par exemple, des terrains comme ici, si vous avez un bon chemin, un chemin tracé au bulldozer, vous pourrez y venir, je sais que je pourrais y venir avec le, le tracteur et la robot. C'est un autre travail quand même avec une paire de bœufs. Maintenant, ça c'est certain que pour employer un tracteur et une robot, les bâtiments ne sont pas adaptés. Ni peut-être les personnes non plus, les pères d'Henri. Il disait qu'il y avait des mondes qui jouaient avec le tracteur. Mais avec les voitures aussi, monsieur. Mais avec les voitures aussi. Ouais, C'est le père d'Henri qui parle. Hein? Pour moi, enchanté, quoi. Je suis médecin, j'aurais pris des clientèles. Hein? Vous n'aurez pas de clientèle. C'est le ah. propre voix qui les aura, lui. <rire> So I'm hoping you can also see Tosquez's charm and humor in these film clips as well. Um, but uh, as I noted, this film clip does a great job in the film itself, uh, does a great job of illustrating the region um, and the shepherds and peasants that lived there. That lived there. Um, so in the scene, Tosquez and another doctor next to him are talking to the sons of the farmer, a new farming technologies and the ensuing conflict between younger and older generations um, and about like thinking collectively uh, throughout uh, generations as well. So the psychiatric revolution in Saint Alban was practiced within limits imposed by material life in the impoverished countryside of Lozère in occupied France, um, as in under conditions of famine, cold, exile, deportations, and isolation. Joanna Masso writes that working with these contingencies meant considering life as a space of possible transformations through experimentation of the practical and not through some sort of programmatic utopia. So again, against the sort of idea of a fixed formula or model to follow, um, as well as against the pure utopia that would be anti-psychiatry as Tosquet has criticized it. From 1940 to 1945, approximately 40,000 patients died in French psychiatric hospitals in what was called the soft extermination. The Vichy regime in France let patients die from lack of care, lack of medicine, starvation, and of cold while the Nazi state was actively exterminating the disabled. Remarkably, and as an exception to the norm, there were no deaths at Saint Alban during this time. The patients at the hospital helped the farmers or peasants in the region with work in the fields for meat, butter, and other available provisions. And this was before Tuskegee's time. Um, German Balve, who was Paul Balve's wife, um, and also a psychiatrist, although she didn't hold a position in the hospital, had extensive knowledge of plants and organized gardening workshops on medicinal plants and mushroom foraging. Um, she was particularly known for her nettle soup. Thus, even before Tosquez, the collective at Saint Alban was already radically transforming psychiatric practice. Agnes Masson, the director before Paul Balve, who invited Tosquez, uh, is even less known than Tosquez. Although I do want to note that Tosquez was often quick to attribute the legacies he inherited from Masson and other women central to the movement. Um, so there's a lot of obscured histories within these marginalized histories as well. So geopsychiatry dates back to Masson traveling by car to collect escaped patients in the region or to find patients in the countryside and the village, including on-site care services and outpatients after care. Um, a quick note just on the collection of escaped patients. I still don't know so much about it regarding the practicality of it and uh, sort of um, how it was done. But to my knowledge, there was some sort of exchange where patients could also stay for days with families. Um, but yeah, these are things that we can sort of stress and think about when uh, thinking about abolition and institutional psychotherapy. Um, Masson was also involved in other instances of removing restrained movements, uh, such as removing straitjackets. Um, I believe you read about the story uh, 
in Moss's essay where Masson, uh, Agnes Masson instructs a nurse who doesn't think that restraint jackets are a problem as uh, she instructs her to wear it for a couple hours. Um, and after, after her experience of wearing one of these, uh, this nurse along with the nurses that were witness to the experience subsequently advocate against the use of it. So Masson was who Tosqueyes would attribute to radically reconfigure, reconfiguring Saint Alban and instituting collective life there. As in, without Masson, there would have been no Saint Alban as we talk of now, um, through things like installing electricity, heating, a laundry mat, uh, creating an internal economy through an internal currency system, establishing a cinema, a library, um, and importantly, allowing patients to negotiate both the length of stay uh, and treatment along with relaxed exit and entry regulations. Um, her care policy and politics included things like permitting mirrors, towel racks, and rights like not having patients be required to undress in front of personnel or others. So an important note on geopsychiatry, hearkening back to Tosquez's uncle's leave of the city for the village, was the role of Saint Alban's peripheral location to major cities, um, which is indicative of uh, other institutions um, or alternatives to institutions uh, throughout France within sort of radical psychiatry, um, where its rural location in a less desirable area for doctors to stay in made it a transitory place on the way to hospitals and urban centers. In centers. <clears throat> Therefore, it was neglected and not as subject to strict oversight and regulations. And subsequently, the, uh, the hospital had more opportunities to experiment. So as indicated earlier, Saint Alban was also a site, um, a major site of resistance in terms of hiding political and Jewish refugees, along with injured, injured resistance militants, um, many of which included poets, surrealists, neurologists, and more who were also involved uh, in the collective and activities at the asylum as well. Um, the asylum was a refuge then in many senses of the term and also open and welcome to the outside as well. As Tosquet has remarked, to be truly open does not just depend on the walls, but an openness to the sector, to real life. So of the various activities and programming already going on in Saint Alban under the occupation, such as a cooking council, a canteen, a sports club named after uh, Paul Balbe, or under him, uh, the hospital produced a wall newspaper. Masso notes that most likely unbeknownst to Balve at this time, uh, as he instituted the wall newspaper, the wall newspapers were actually a common militant practice in the Spanish Civil War, uh, where information was circulated through a bulletin-like collective collage as a public and participatory tool that radically transformed the stuff of psychoanalysis, as in the experience of reading and writing, uh, and precisely as collectively engaged. So with Tosquez came the production of two distinct newspapers, Le Chaman, The Path, which was distributed outside of the hospital, and an internal newspaper, Trap d'Union, which means hyphen, uh, that was not meant to be distributed outside of the hospital. There were collective readings of the newspapers in the hospital, and Balvé remarked that the newspapers were an integral therapeutic tool for self-management. The newspaper that was meant to travel outside of the hospital quite literally names a path. Not unlike, I think, the path of escape in the refugee camp that Tosquet has worked in, as well as a path to the social and public milieu that Fanon advocated for in day hospitalization. The internal newspaper, named Hyphen, indicates both a cleave in both senses of the term, the split and the fastening, more as a suturing with an irreducible gap. It leaves the mechanism of division and combination open for the hospital to the outside, through its inner reconfigurations of roles, functions, relations, organizations, and hierarchies through language. Both newspapers then encouraged ex exchanges with the immediate community outside of the hospital as also part of this collective, albeit through different means. So I wanna show another one of Mario Rispoli's films in collaboration with Tosquez. Um, apparently Tosquez actually asked him to film the hospital after they filmed uh, the sort of surrounding countryside. Um, and these will just be some clips of all the various activities I just named. Um, 
másik pedig v Sandy Marka trhal v čase, ale za byť byl by ten pinia pozrieť tam. Ses mains ne filent guère qu'un monde étroit et dérisoire. Toute parole cycle. Et pourtant l'homme fou s'en prend aux choses et les travaille, comme tout homme. Un monde nouveau se tisse tant bien que mal en tâtonnant. Dans cette aventure, l'homme fou se donne aux autres, puis se reprend. Quelque chose s'édifie. Quelque chose comme un langage se noue. Quelque chose comme une vie sociale s'organise. Non sans mal, non sans aberration. Certains parviennent à aliéner leurs mains en un travail mécanique, l'esprit vacant à sa folie. dans une parole définitive, un monde dont le sens les fuit de toutes parts. Je ne vais pas céder dans ce répugnant respect humain qui n'est en rien le respect de l'homme, de la vie en et par chaque homme. Voilà, il ne pouvait pas, il ne devait pas céder à ce répugnant respect humain qui fait que fait que lorsque de sous-ordre décide euh, décide euh, décide euh, euh, décide de la mort héroïque et cette fois, de plus, médecins et infirmiers s'emploient à redresser ces distorsions, à briser ces défenses contre l'angoisse, ces murs intérieurs de la folie. Chaque jour s'élabore et s'affine des techniques de vie sociale où le malade péniblement se retrouvera parmi les autres et se refera une raison. So it's not until 1961 that Tuskegee meets the filmmaker Mario Raspoli, whose two films we've seen clips of now. Uh, the first being, I realized I didn't title them, uh, The Earth's Forgotten, uh, and the second being A Look at Madness. Um, Mario Raspoli was close to filmmakers Jean Rouche and Chris Marker, um, so he's sort of already embedded in films interested in lived experience. Um, which film scholars call the phenomenological turn in observational cinema uh, and in direct cinema, such as Rouche's Cinema Verite and Marker's Film Essays. So Dusquez collaborates with Rispoli on these three films uh, around Saint Alban. And I think in one of the activities, you see uh, some of the patients sort of making confetti uh, from paper. <laughs> 
uh, the third film that they collaborated on, which follows the one that you just watched, uh, is about a party that's thrown uh, with the villagers uh, and the patients at the hospital. Um, so filming was an essential uh, tool for Tusquets as a form of pedagogy. Uh, in his return to Spain for the International Conference for Psychotherapy uh, in 1958, which I believe was his first return to Spain since uh, being in exile in France, uh, he actually also meets Lacan here. Um, he shows a silent film he, sh he shoots with his wife, Elena, in Saint Alban. Uh, the film for Tusquets is, is an image of the social life of the hospital. Um, but it's also to show the patients talking to themselves, or sorry, talking to them, patients to themselves as well. Uh, I do also want to show another clip. Um, there were various meetings at Saint Alban, um, and this one I think does a really good job of showing um, the sort of self criticisms uh, that the doctors had uh, of their practice. Um, And sort of questioning their own uh, fears and pathologies towards the patients. Okay. J'ai l'impression d'avoir été joué par le malade, tout à fait, hein, et de ne pas de ne pas m'en être sorti autrement que. Euh, de m'en être sorti plutôt sans technicité ou en renvoyant la question. Sans, euh, mais je suis prouvé de gêne, c'est d'accord. Dans la structure d'hôpital, nous avons notre rôle qui nous protège. Et nous avons en somme tout ce dont nous avons été investis par euh, notre situation administrative ou par même la complicité tacite du public, on pourrait dire. Tandis qu'à partir du moment où nous sommes enregistrés et où nous sommes filmés, Nous nous, nous sentons beaucoup plus responsables vis-à-vis -vis de nous-mêmes. En écoutant cet enregistrement, je me suis et j'ai subi une excision de ma personnalité. J'ai eu une oreille psychiatrique et d'autre côté, vous avez dit, j'ai une autre oreille publique, hein? Hein? Euh, la réaction du public. Donc, tu étais obligé de vivre en toi cet déchirement de la psychiatre, enfin, comme il dirait peut-être les gentils, d'être représentant hein, des instincts hein, plus ou moins collaborés du malade, d'être le miroir de ça hein, pour permettre son développement. Nous avons aussi nos interventions chirurgicales. Oui. Nous sommes aussi obligés à faire souffrir les malades. Oui. Nous oui. avons nos accès à ouvrir. Une question qui a été suscitée par, euh, par hier, C'était cette comparaison assez curieuse qu'il faisait avec les, euh, disons, les, entre les infirmiers et des gardiens de musée. Que voulait-il dire exactement par là D'abord, qu'il était une chose précieuse. Il se comparait à un tableau, à une œuvre d'art. Un objet esthétique, une objet, oui. Peut-être aussi qu'il aurait pris que le et le rationnel, parce qu'il aurait fallu, pour prouver quelque chose de public, que le malade soit délirant. S'il avait vu un malade délirant, il aurait davantage, ça aurait été beaucoup plus difficile pour le public. Mais le malade, le public ne se l'apercevra pas, étant donné qu'il parle de façon cohérente. Mais c'est une question de l'élite trop du langage. Oui, mais le spectateur, le spectateur, disons du film, parce que nous avons quand même pensé de profiter des événements qui se passent tous les jours à l'hôpital pour pouvoir quand même faire un film dans lequel on ne fasse pas simplement un film de propagande en disant « Monsieur, monsieur, venez, venez que les psychiatres sont de braves types. » Arrivé à ce point, il me semble que ce qu'il faut remettre en question et ce qu'il faudrait peut-être bien montrer au public, c'est cette ambiguïté fondamentale qu'il y a dans les notions de maladie et de guérison quand on parle de maladie mentale et quand on parle de la folie. Mais c'est quelque chose qui quand même déborde infiniment cette notion de maladie. Et à partir du moment où on aborde ces problèmes de maladie, entre guillemets, des malades, ou de guérison, toujours entre guillemets, on se heurte à tout le contexte culturel, à tout le contexte social, on se heurte à toute la difficulté de saisir l'histoire entière du malade. Est-ce que c'est un salaud, le psychiatre 
Et oui, parce que l'attitude hein? psychiatrique passe par l'angoisse du malade. Mais peut-être, c'est un salaud. S'il si, si faut la soloperie pour guérir quelqu'un, euh, à, à la rigueur, on peut être un salaud. Et pourquoi pas Parce qu'on entend pas être salaud. Mais pourquoi ah, là, pour... Mais on euh, assume le coup. Mais pourquoi tu m'aimes guérir Moi, je ne demande pas de guérir. Est-ce que nous avons le droit de guérir quelqu'un contre sa volonté C'est le problème qui se pose continuellement avec tous les psychologues euh, qui ne viennent ça, pas ça, nous demander ça, de guérir. C'est un problème un peu faux parce que dans quelle mesure il a une conscience de soi-même et de ses besoins Est-ce que le chirurgien ne doit pas opérer une appendicite parce qu'un enfant de 3 ans ne lui demande pas de lui enlever Tu comprends que ça pose ce problème. Donc je pense qu'il faut guérir malgré la volonté du malade. So, you see them discussing Tosquez's uh, film with his wife um, on sort of the image of the social life of the hospital as well. Um, so Tosquez's interest in these other forms of technology extends later on into the 1960s uh, when he makes a sort of return to the Paramata Institute amidst a very strong deinstitutionalization movement in Spain. He agrees to transform the institution uh, via tapes or cassette groups in the 1970s, where he analyzes recorded meetings of the medical collective and patients at Paramata. So he stays in France and then goes to visit, I think, once, once a month. Um, so one could see this also as an intensive extension of geopsychiatry. Uh, Tosquet is similar to his interest in film pedagogy, was focused less so on the content uh, and more on the device itself and the role that it plays in meetings and subsequent transformations and possibilities, uh, just as we see uh, the doctors talking about uh, this element of recording uh, and questioning if uh, the film is in fact propaganda for hospitals and psychiatrists. Um, now to go back to Fanon after sort of this dizzying trip through Tosquez's history. Fanon arrived to do his residency at Saint Alban from 1952 to 53. Despite Fanon and Tosquez's theoretical and clinical practices shared subjects from the militant political to exile, foreignness, colonialism, war, and decentered locations, as Jean Falfa points out, their collaboration was concentrated in science, where Tosquez and Fanon published joint pieces of writing on, uh, very controversially, electroshock therapy or Beanie treatment. Um, and as Joanna Masso analyzes, both were also invested in phenomenology as well as inscription and culture. Masso continues to write that Fanon was highly influenced by his collaboration with Tosquez and the practices at Saint Alban in terms of the relationship between psychiatric experimentation and geographical decentering, as well as between psychotherapeutic transformation and political transformation. These relationships, as stated earlier, were most concretized in Fanon's experience in Blida, where he joins the FLN. As Tosquet has remarked in a publication 30 years after Fanon's death, the emphasis that Fanon placed during his stay in Algeria and his participation in the FLN on the peasant engine in political change was also an echo of his lived experience, both in Martinique and around the Saint Alban hospital. We can think back to the Rispoli film we watched and the communities living in Lozère and their role in the psychiatric revolution at the hospital. In a text dedicated to Fanon, Tosquez summarizes institutional psychotherapy by noting that madness is constitutive of man and that without this analysis of madness, psychiatry dismisses the problem of madness as a simple mechanism from within and without. It seems very impractical to me, he says, and even dangerous for me. It's funny that we could talk about institutional psychotherapy as a desire to keep the crazy people inside. So how do we negotiate this constitution of the subject that is both troubling universal givens of the subject as man, uh, given the promiscuity and definition of mad or so-called madness, and also in constantly negotiating the shifting withins and withouts of the subject with Tosquez's assertion that the space of all psychotherapy is not in fact a space intended to welcome the reality, to bring it back to life. Institutional psychotherapy in this dynamic shifting of borders then is explicitly also a desire of transformation 
of what is designated as reality and normal, and given while simultaneously maintaining some perimeter of a refuge as protection. Fanon rearticulates this tension as dialectical and note locates the proposal of day hospitalization as outside of this dialectic. I would argue that this interiority and exteriority is not one that marks an exterior that is some knowable or assumed reality and an interiority that is refuge for that reality or some border of difference that demarcates this within and without. The shifting outside is not to mark an end to illness or madness, even within these processes of care and healing of suffering. In fact, this vertiginous spatialization in which the terms and conditions of interior and exterior are not stable or also not given, follows similarly to Fanon's letter of resignation, where he states, if psychiatry is the medical technique that endeavors to enable individuals to cease being foreign to their environment, I owe it to myself to state that the Arab, permanently alienated in his own country, lives in a state of absolute depersonalization. The within and without at Lida collapses, not totally, but into a series of various withins and withouts, directly confronting that absolute state of alienation instituted by colonialism. Saint-Alban, as Tosquet has remarked, was a hypothesis of a place open inside and out, another transformulation of withins and withouts, where a practice of plurality and diversity did not lend itself to fragmentation. In other words, Saint-Alban is expressed as a hypothesis of a topology of the open, where distortions, inversions, and subversions are enacted while maintaining a continuity of the open. Such a spatial configuration, I think, runs counter to a dialectical expression which renders the prior opening as some closure that encounters a rupture that proceeds into a new opening. Fanon's exchange of the two freedoms, an open inside and out, and mutual exchange of opens, then experiments with this hypothesis, introducing a cartography through the openings themselves. Institutional psychotherapy, therefore, radically destabilizes the, ob the object of genocidal logic and fantasy, the fixed in and out towards enclosure, pathologization, and totality. If, as Daniel Barber states, the survival of the world, after all, is a matter of reproduction, of a development and futurity that even, or especially, when emergent in the guise of threat or crisis, manages to extend itself in ever more supple and more micro-calibrated degrees. As we are witness to in this particular moment uh, and history of Zionist, aka Western ordered world maintaining and strengthening, these topologies, cartographies, and spatializations work against such reproducings while also calling attention to them, particularly heightened and extended and articulated in crisis, threat, or war. While the gap afforded by the division that constitutes the field of world presents world as both the given and the possible, the simultaneous within and without of the world located in the division and subsequent gap, in fact, enables the coherence and reproduction of the given instead of threatening it through the possible. Fanon's attempts to break these reproductions via specificity of the position of race conceives resistance as end of world and the limiting possible that is sutured to the given. Through its constant making and unmaking of boundaries, then, institutional psychotherapy as a practice of resistance, most concretely as a practice that attempts to build life, world anew, via practice that ends world. Thank you. Oh, Pumana, thank you so, so much. And I apologize for my voice. I'm coughing. Um, there's so, so much here. And I just want to say thank you for bringing all of the film clips to us. It's su such a, a truly rare gift. <clears throat> and let me know if you have questions by raising your hand or in the chat, and I can attempt to read them out. And if I fail to, maybe Wendy can back my play. Um, but questions for Parwana? Okay, I will I will ask one while people get ready. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to uh, on a pretty different tact 
but on the role here of the filmic of like what was the kind of you know like this is rather rare actually maybe we should just say that 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 to bring cinema in to the asylum is a kind of innovation that's happening at this moment and i'm wondering if you can just talk to us about like was there a kind of concerted political program i mean i know that twiskeus and you've just given us this whole rehearsal of the history like so beautifully is constantly collaborating with artists there's art in I also, by the way, dropped you a note in the chat that we need the nettle soup recipe, obviously of high import archivally. Um, but if you can just say a little bit about like how these films circulated, how they end up, like why it's quite so rare that you've brought them to us and just sort of to situate because you've beautifully pulled them through the whole talk. I, I would love to hear more about that visual regime. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and answering it is quite complicated. Um, in terms of art as well, um, and as, as we know, like cameras are tied to surveillance. Uh, there's also very troubling films that attempt to sort of, uh, yeah, serve as like propaganda for hospitals. You see the doctors talking about, um, and not to sort of diverge too much, but there's there's a really rich and troubled history of so-called art brute or outsider art that originated from Saint Alban, uh, which Joanna Masso and Eric Fasson write about uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, and that history is Jean Dubuffet, the artist and sort of the originator of art brute or outsider art sort of inserted himself into the institution. He found out through all these poets and artists that were uh, um, housed in the asylum through like artists like August Forestier and all these patients that were making objects which were supposed to be made um, as a form of exchange with the peasants, with the outside world. Um, he called them art. Uh, Tosque sort of refused to see him. He tried to like, uh, he, he had, he like uh, sent various letters trying to gain access to the institution. Um, somehow through Jean Ori, he was able to get in, he got some art objects, uh, um, bargained with the peasants in the region to get their art objects. Um, and this was very troubling for Tosquez because the notion of outsider art for him, and I think we can also extend this to like certain film movements around or in the asylum, um, posited that the patients were outside of culture, that it was a sort of raw art because they're outside of culture. Uh, and this goes precisely against sort of this discussion that uh, we've been having today on like the interiority and exteriority, even like physically of the hospital. Um, so it was troubling in that regards and also sort of in terms of the practice of ergotherapy, which uh, came from Herman Simon. Uh, one of his books, uh, Herman Simon's books on ergotherapy was supposedly one of the books that Tosquez uh was carrying while crossing the Pyrenees into Saint Alban. Um, Herman Simon was a eugenicist. Um, his ergotherapy was sort of a way to classify labor ability of the disabled. Um, so Tosquez had a pretty troubled and uh, ambiguous relationship to Simon's work, but he emphasized that the making of these objects uh, termed outsider art by Dubuffet were both not necessarily art objects, uh, but also not made through sort of like production or through this conception of labor ability, but rather um, uh, meant for exchange and always centered around activity. Um, so this, this is a bit digressing from the film, but uh, as I said, the films were an integral part of Tosquez's pedagogy and not singular to Tosquez. Uh, Fernandellini, whose work um, sort of centers my research, um, was also very invested in film pedagogy, but particularly through these experimental filmmakers. So these were not supposed to be sort of documentaries that, um, like as Tosquez says, it gives sort of a social, an image of social life at the hospital. It's not supposed to be, uh, some sort of like objective reality of the hospital. Um, and I'm trying to think if there were other films of Saint Alban at the time. No, 
The other thing is Rasfoli had a very strong relationship to Tosquez. So many of the people that were invested in radical psychiatry and film pedagogy, the films that they made with filmmakers were made after years of getting to know them and living at the asylum. Um, so it wasn't sort of like um, a fetishistic portrayal of the institution. So really these two models of like the highly extractive and the kind of pedagogical from within to go without to play on how you ended. Yeah, thank you so much. And Wendy. Uh, thank you so much. That was really beautiful. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and you, I think, talked about this obliquely or peripherally uh, throughout your presentation, but I'm wondering to what extent institutional psychiatry, to the extent that it's navigating uh this this question about uh determination from the inside and outside and and where to place these subjects is also part of a particular historical moment in france and even in the west broadly speaking when um these like that that it that it serves as a sort of like uh um a uh, concrete example of of uh various kinds of political and discursive uh uh questions that are being settled in that moment um and obviously uh that has to do with you know the the kind of timeline of of uh france's colonies and these kinds of things which you talked about but um i guess i'm i'm curious how much institutional uh psychiatry like um uh like uh change the course or something of of uh of discourse in general kind of on on like um in in politics and kind of theory of the subject sort of thing yeah i think um in terms of theories of the subject definitely uh camille robes's book disalienation i think does a really great job of uh emphasizing and sort of like historicizing the role of institutional psychotherapy in French philosophy. Um, in terms of policies, I don't, like as I stud, stated earlier, these histories are still quite marginalized today. Um, and there's sort of like renewed interest in this, uh, in, in Saint Alban, in Le Bort, uh, in Fernandellini's work um, as of right now, um, as in these histories are also sort of marginalized in Europe. It's, it's difficult to say about policy because as I said, in the 60s and 70s, there's a huge movement towards deinstitutionalization and the anti-psychiatry movement in Italy saw sort of very direct uh, legal implementations. Um, in terms of in France, I don't, I don't think so. Saint Alban today is is still an institution. It's still an asylum. Um, unfortunately, it's not necessarily practicing institutional psychotherapy. Um, so, I guess in some ways, I could say no. Unfortunately. Thank you, Nika. Go right ahead. Thank you, um, Juana. This was really interesting. Um, I learned a lot. I have many questions. Um, but I'll ask the one that I think is just the most open-ended because I'm curious to hear your thoughts, which is about how we can use the, let's say the genealogy you've developed of institutional psychotherapy to think about um, what in some ways is maybe the most controversial or somehow difficult to frame dimension of Fanon's clinical writings, namely um, the late writings in Wretched on the Earth on like sort of combat trauma, which I know we'll speak about um, later. But in some ways, I think, for example, in Camille Obsis's book, um, they're clearly part of a line of a, of a continuity of um, psychic, psychiatric work that Fanon was undertaking, but they also challenge us to think about what is the institution or the kind of, um, you know, constellation that's at issue for Fanon at that time. And so I'll just ask as an open-ended question, which is how can what this sort of history you've described helped us think about those particularly like vexing set of case studies um, that I think partly because they were written so, so soon before his death often linger a little bit um, homeless in the in the reception? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, I think I'm I'm reading 
and sort of like working through this text on day hospitalization is sort of the way in which to approach it. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of sort of the divergences we see in sort of taking into account, yes, these histories of institutional psychotherapy and those later case studies that Fanon is writing about uh, is not only in his sort of like mutation of institutional psychotherapy and concretization, I think, uh, especially with this question of abolition and liberation, um, is also potentially like different, um, different formulations of madness. Um, Tosquez writes that uh, freedom is not found outside of the hospital. Um, Fanon writes about uh, madness as a pathology of freedom. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think this question could maybe be addressed through the different conceptions of madness for both Fanon and Tosquez. Thank you. There's a small question in the chat, Juana, which is just, can you repeat the names of the films? Yes. Uh, the first film was uh, Medea Solares and Joanna Masso's The Potential History of Francesca Tosquez. Um, and this will be screening this summer at various institutions in New York, if you live in New York. Um, and the other two films, which you can actually watch on Ovid, <laughs> so I guess this is a plug for Ovid TV, um, but you can also have a free subscription, um, is The Earth's Forgotten and um, A Look at Madness and The Prisoner's Party is a third film, which we didn't watch a clip from. Thank you. Nika, go again, please. I can ask endless questions on this topic, and it was such a wonderful presentation, so I'll take the opportunity. Um, I guess I was, I wanted to ask you about, I was thinking as you were speaking about the question of work and labor, because within France and with also in French Marxism, and of course Marx is the other kind of pole besides Lacan for Tosquets in some ways, you have this kind of reconfiguring of the worker and of labor and the activities of labor in the asylum, which you've spoken about so beautifully. And I think one thing, if we follow not just Lacan, but Marx in the sort of turn to Fanon is this question of the way that, um, let's say colonial subjects, they're, the, the, the sense in which they're always figured in a racialized sense as laborers, in some ways presents the, I think for Fanon, the re-inhabiting or refiguring of work. I think in some ways there's a more radical or in some ways more directly Marxian critique of labor in, in Fanon's writings. And so I just wondered like, how should we think about Tosquez's relation to work and its trajectories today in terms of like the possibility of reconfiguring work as a dimension of the therapeutic enterprise, but also in sustaining like the, the necessary forms of Marxian critiques of labor as their practice today, especially if we think of labor as something which is always racialized. Because um, the film shows so beautifully this thing that's always intriguing to me also in Camille's work about um, the way that, that um, Sanaban plays with the with the question of work, which is understood to have a therapeutic importance. And some of that I think is more ambivalent for Fanon because it's so clear that the figuring of certain subjects as fundamentally workers obscures the therapeutically necessary frame. Um, so I was just be curious for your thoughts on that topic. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um I guess, like historically speaking, in Saint Alban, when they when the patients were making objects, they were bartering them for money, or cigarettes, or food. Um, so there was a sort of like both localized economy within the hospital and also outside of the hospital with the peasants. There's some great stories of August Forestier, like sort of like putting up his uh, his his artwork. I would call it artwork sort of like on the borders of the hospital. So when the shepherds were walking in with their goats, they would see them and then like exchange. But yeah, I don't know, this is an excellent question. And I, I think I need to think it through more. Um, yeah, I, I leave that open for all, 
Go ahead, Rizbe. Yeah. Um, hi. Thank you, Prawana. That was wonderful. Um, I guess kind of rereading the the Fennel articles um, on the day hospital in Tunis, it was, I was kind of struck by, by the kind of the, the hard departure from institutional psychotherapy that he, he took the kind of harsh kind of critiques of it that he had in these articles, like even citing Moss and calling the institution a cemented cadaver. Like it was just like, it was as opposed to like his writings in Belida where it was like, okay, well we tried this. And like, for example, when he's talking about a word of Muslim men, for example, in Belida and he's like, okay, well we tried, you know, like ergotherapy and like basket weaving and Christmas concerts and the Muslim men weren't interested. I wonder why, like, so it, it was, it was more like in that context, it was more like, oh, you know, we, we adapted it to Blida, but then reading him on the day hospital, it was like, no kind of like hard, no, like the day hospital. Um, and I guess this, you know, this rejoins a lot of what you, the kind of the dialectic between the, these kind of the, the porous border where it's situated as opposed to the, the complete abolition of the borders um, and the, the free or as free as it gets circulation between kind of the hospital and the patient. Um, but yeah, I, I was, I was just like, it, it struck me how the kind of the tone changed um, and I didn't remember it as being so drastic. So I wonder if, I don't know, you could talk about that or if you have anything to say about that. Well, yeah, that's precisely why I wanted us to read this to sort of yeah. Hold and bounce, like explore sort of institutional psychotherapy and think about Fanon's maybe like most radical break from it following his joining of the FLN. I think, uh, and I think I, I stated this a couple of times earlier, I think Fanon's proposal, both the joining of the FLN and his proposal of day hospitalization is perhaps the most concrete expression of institutional psychotherapy. And the fact that in some ways, because institutional psychotherapy was never meant to be a model, never meant to be a fixed formula. In some ways, even what he was constituting in Algeria was sort of following some sort of formula that did inevitably sort of, was inevitably set up by institutional psychotherapy. So I think he's very radically breaking that formula um, where the institution does become fixed when there's sort of like a set of, uh, things that are sort of instituted to make it radical psychiatry. Um, so in some ways I, I still see it, I still see it as a practice of institutional psychotherapy. I think he's like putting a lot of tension on what needs to be addressed. Um, and um, yeah, is, uh, is of issue. Uh, can we call institutional psychotherapy an abolitionist project? I would say yes, but I don't think that that's necessarily a given. And I think you could argue otherwise as well. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions for Prolana on this brilliant and it's just like so comprehensive like presentation? Yeah. So I'll say that next week we have Emily Hoffman joining us and we'll be sort of continuing and tearing in this mode. Um, the readings are posted now and then we'll we'll have our final session two weeks from today with Nadia Abu Al-Hajj, uh, also talking about the kind of afterlives of combat trauma. Um, so thinking about that, those pieces of Fanon's work that were, were just raising the question, we will we will conclude there. Um, but for now, please join me in thanking Prawana so much for taking the time and putting together this amazing set of uh, films and intertexts. It was incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was truly wonderful. Bye. Thank you all.